Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Drs. Siddhartha Mukherjee and Adam Rutherford. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming for a, a very special evening to listen to um, Siddhartha Mukherjee Sid talking about his brand new book. Now, um, uh, Nicole just mentioned some of the accolades that, that, uh, that Sid has had over the last few years, but I, I want to mention a few of them again. There really are far too many to list, but um, The Emperor of, of All Maladies, The Guardian's best first book, uh, it was a Pulitzer Prize winner. Time voted it one of the 100 most important books of all time. Then he wrote a book called The Gene, An Intimate History, uh, New York Times bestseller. Uh, then he took some time off and wrote a short introduction to a book called A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived, which was by me. That wasn't a New York Times bestseller, but it did okay. And this is the new one. So basically, this is a man who, you've got two bearded Indian men on stage, and I've spent quite a lot of my career trying to emulate him, uh, but with little success. <laughs> this is the new book, The Song of the Cell, and it really is a sort of pioneer song, a, 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 an elegy about the fundamental basic units of life, the cell, something which I think is overlooked in, in biology, in the pop popular discourse about biology, and we're going to talk about that. You might have heard us uh, chewing the fat on the start of the week on Monday when we were uh, talking about this book. Now we've got a whole hour to do it. We're going to chew the fat, talk for a bit, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. We like audience participation as much as, as possible. Um, but let me just start with a few biographical questions, yes. because you, people know your work here, bestsellers in the UK as well, um, shortlisted for the Royal Society Book Prize and the Welcome Book Prize, um, but maybe they don't know you as well, because you're, you live in New York. So why don't you give us a sort of two-minute potted biography of how you get from Bengal via Delhi to New York back to London. <laughs> well, I, I was, my family is Bengali. I was not born in Bengal. I was born in Delhi um, and went to school there. Um, then um, went to Stanford, of all places, um, in California um, as an undergraduate. Um, worked in Paul Berg's lab, um, which is, of course, very much part of the the book on genetics. Um, Paul Berg, first person to do genetic engineering in the world, 1973. Nobel Prize in 1980? Mm, nah, a little later. I want to say. Nah, so yeah. it's a good lab, anyway, the point is, yeah. <laughs> um, then came, I was a Rhodes Scholar, came to Oxford um, and was there for three years, studied immunology with Alan Townsend, who's in this book. Um, Alan is a close friend. Paul's also a close friend. Paul's 90. I'm having dinner with him next week. Um, and um, so uh, uh, Paul loves to have bets. And every, every time I see him, he, he has a bet with me about something or the other. It could be something completely random. Um, and and the, the loser takes the winner out to dinner. And this has been going on for 10 years. But anyway, so Paul Berg then came to Allen Townsend, Allen Townsend. Wait, I want to know what the bets are. <laughs> this and and who's winning? <laughs> well, this time, actually, I won. Um, the bet was actually an interesting bet. The bet was that the Nobel Prize for the discovery of CRISPR would be either awarded just to Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, who are actually close friends of mine, versus it would be split three ways, because there's an option of splitting it three ways, um, to someone else. And Paul chose the three, so he had a winner's advantage, because it could be anyone. Uh -huh. um, and I said, just Jennifer and Emmanuel. The, I, I, I thought that the, the discovery was, was so momentous, it would be just Jennifer and, and Emmanuel. Um, and I won. Um, but now you have to pay for dinner in Oxford. No, no, he has to pay for dinner. Oh, because it's, you it's, won. Yeah, I yeah, won. I got yes, it. Yeah, yeah. He has to pay for dinner. That's a much better wherever, deal. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so anyway, back to biography. Um, I, so then I went, I was, at, um, I was at Stanford, then came to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, um, lived in Oxford for three years, worked with Alan, um, then went to Harvard Medical School where I trained in medicine first, um, uh, ran the emergency room for about six months, uh, which was a frightening experience. Uh, I think more frightening for the patients than for me. Um, 
and then um, did my fellowship in cancer biology, cancer medicine, but I had already had my PhD from Oxford, so I was an immunologist by training. Um, and so after all of that, um, launched my own laboratory at Columbia, where I teach and write and do various other things. It's kind of revolting how overqualified you, you are. <laughs> well, it, um, I suppose it can be revolting, but it didn't feel revolting when I was, uh, <laughs> when I was doing those things. And so, so in, in order to get to this book, let's, let's just quickly go, go through the other, the other two books. So as you are a cancer specialist, you're an oncologist, you're a practicing doctor to this day when you're not writing best-selling books. But um, the first book, The Emperor of All Maladies, which was a huge, mega international bestseller, that is, the subtitle is a biography of, of cancer. So what was it that, 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 that you wanted to explore in your field as an expert well, it, in that You book? know, to some extent, The Emperor was, a, um, was written because it wasn't there. Um, when, I mean, obviously, we're living in an age of cancer. I mean, the word appears every day in, the, in, in every newspaper. And um, when you look around, when I looked around, this was um, in, 2000, when I started writing the book was 2006. Um, when I looked around, there was no history of it. Um, where had it come from? Where were we going? And it was inspired by a patient's question. She said, uh, um, and she was asking a question about her own, journey, she said, um, how did I get here and where am I going? Um, but if you take that question very broadly um, and think about how did we get here and where are we going, it becomes the Emperor of All Maladies, it becomes that book. Um, and so um, that was the inspiration for, for that book. It was a, it, it, it was that, that, that book was trying to fill a void. Um, and to some extent, the gene also was trying to fill a void um, because it seemed to me that there had been, of course, very, very good books on, on, on genetics uh, before, but, it had, but they, they had sort of lapsed um, in the post, um, what I would call the post-genomic era, in, in the era of sequencing whole genomes and, and CRISPR, um, and all the um, vast landscape of both therapeutic and mm. ethical issues that, were, that had been brought up by that. Um, and there, there was also, I think, um, which you know very well from your most recent book, um, there was also a, um, 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 a, a lack, um, we were just talking about this, a lack of um, understanding of the, of the very complex and potentially um, uh, discomforting um, uh, birth of genetics, human genetics in particular, uh, which is through eugenics and Gorton and, and others that you mentioned in your, in your new book. Um, and it was as if that part of the history had been erased mm -hmm. and um, genetics all of a sudden sprang like, you know, out of Zeus's head in, in you know, 1920 or something like that, when in fact its origins are very much in the pre-war era um, with um, a, a, a very um, uncomfortable history of, of, of the idea of human selection and human genetics. So genetics filled that void, and we'll just talk about the void that this book fills as well. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that is a common theme in all three books is that you write from the perspective of a scientist and a science historian, but also as a clinician. And that, that, that I think, is, is kind of unique to your work, that, that, that so many of the themes that are, well, obviously in a book about cancer, it's about patients, but in the gene, it also relates to disease and treating patients, and in this book, in the, the Song of the Cell as well. There, a lot of it's the history, which I find absolutely fascinating um, and, and, and teach and have studied myself. But then there's this other dimension to it, which is how the history and the basic science and the genetics, how that actually re re relates to patients, to disease. Yes, and, and I think the, the important thing in these books, well, first of all, I should say that the, the books are written, if one were to reread the books, and eventually I hope they'll be compiled into a quartet, if there's a quartet, if there's a book after this. Um, I'm only saying that because um, when uh, the Emperor won the Guardian Book Prize, um, there was a snarky review that said, 
um, this should have been called the Guardian only book prize because <laughs> he's done with anything he has to ever write. Um, but that was not the case, obviously. But, um, um, but that, all of that said, um, I think I make, a, in all three books, um, in fact, the gene probably should come first um, because it is, of course, the single smallest unit of information, uh, the code. Um, the cell probably comes next. Um, and emperor comes last because it's about when cells go wrong and physiology gets affected. Um, so that's one important piece. Um, but I think probably the most uh, important idea that runs through these books, um, and I'll introduce it early in the conversation, is the distinction between disease and desire. Um, uh, and that's very important for me as a thinker, but also important for us as a society, and also important for me as a clinician uh, and as a doctor, because um, we have drawn historically very strong uh, boundaries between disease and desire. And I'll, by, it's quite ob obvious, but I'll explain it a little bit anyway. But please. disease, of course, is, is, is fundamentally linked to the idea of suffering. Um, and um, and we have understood disease uh, for, for generations since the beginning of, of human history. Um, desire is, is linked to some idea of enhancement or augmentation, something that we cannot do, that we want to do. Um, and I would suggest that really for centuries, um, these lines were relatively easily drawn, uh, the line between disease and desire. Um, but now, um, as we invade uh, biology uh, with more and more um, precision, but, but more and more audacity, um, I think these lines are being rapidly blurred. Um, and that's why I think these books need to enter the conversation, because, um, because those lines are extraordinarily important to draw. And if you don't draw them, I think, you know, many things that we understand about the world will change, and perhaps not for the better. Okay, well, let, let's, let's talk about the Song of the Cell. Let's get really stuck into it, because that's why you're here, and that's, that's the book that we're talking about. Um, we will get to, uh, during the course of this conversation, we want to talk about the therapies and, yes. and the, the desires and all of those things that you've just mentioned. But let's, let's talk about the history, because the history is fascinating. Yes. Yes. But even before we get to that... I think we should establish some ground rules about what we mean when we're talking about cells. Because I know we have spent a lot of our lives staring at these pretty un often pretty unremarkable sort of translucent globs down yes. microscopes. And maybe you did when you, I don't know, sliced up an onion at GCSE biology or did some hematology or something like that. And I don't know, they look, they, they, they can be pretty unremarkable. And yet, they are the basic unit of life full of diversity, active cities buzzing with action. They are where life exists. And I think you made a very important point, both in your program and just now, which is that that is absolutely true. But bizarrely enough, uh, they've been sort of neglected. Um, I wouldn't say, of course, not neglected in the literature, in the scientific literature. I'm a cell biologist. But, but if you... If you um, I, I was walking past, um, uh, um, I, I told you this in the program, a Brazilian Botox clinic called Life. I, I wasn't getting Botox, but... Um, but really? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it had a picture of DNA on it. Um, so every time you go through anything that's called Life, you know, a magazine cover on Life, etc., etc., it'll have the iconic double helix um, on it. Um, but of course, the, the, a G, which is, the, you know, DNA contains the information um, for, for genetics, for genes. But what's interesting, and what you realize quite obviously when you think about it, DNA is a molecule. It doesn't, it's lifeless. It is not life. Uh, it is only brought to life by a cell. A cell interprets DNA in the same way that a musician interprets a score. A score is not music. It's the musician playing the music that is music. Hence the song of the cell, but um, but but um, 
So it's the cell that really where, is where life begins in some ways, it, if you want to think about life. And we, I thought you put it very nicely in, in the program. There, it, it, there, there are really three foundational pieces of all biology. Um, and by foundational pieces, they, they are so universal that they, that they span the entire biological universe as we know it. Um, the number one being the universality of, of, genet of the genetic code and, and genetics. Um, there are variations on the theme, but essentially the universality of it. The second is cell theory, the fact that all organisms, regardless of whether you're an elephant or a bacterium, uh, you're made of a cell. Um, and the third, of course, is evolution. Um, now, evolution has a thousand books written on it. Genetics has 2,000 books written on it, including mine. What's interesting is that there wasn't, or there really isn't, a kind of similar book about the importance of the third pillar of, of all life. Um, so, unremarkable, remarkable as it is, um, the cell is remarkable. It is, the, it is the smallest living unit of life, and that thing you saw, that blob you saw um, under a microscope, or a much more complex cell like the one that lives in your brain, um, does things. Uh, it's the actor, it's the doer, it's the maker, um, the, sometimes the teacher. Um, that's responsible for, for everything that, that, that we do or be or our, 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 our whole being. Um, and so therefore, I mean, you, you're exactly right. I mean, it, what looks sometimes unremarkable is really the center of all, 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 all being. There is a